Hello and welcome to the latest Science of Sport podcast. I'm your host, Matt Solomon, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Myers. So Chris is an exercise physiologist at the US 2nd Air Support Operation Squadron in Germany, and before that, he was a serving member of the US Army. He's also completed his PhD, which he did with the US Navy, and therefore it makes him the perfect guest today to discuss how you can improve your sport performance by learning from tactical operators. So without further ado, it's time to welcome Chris onto the show. So Chris, welcome to the Science of Sport podcast. Pleasure to have you here. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. So can you give us a quick introduction as to who you are and what you've been up to until now? Yeah, definitely. So uh, everyone, I'm Chris Myers. Uh, I'm an embedded uh, exercise physiologist for the United States Air Force over here in Germany. Um, so what embedded means is I work with the same unit day in and day out. So I work with the same uh, 100 individuals every every day. Um, and I work more in the um, my line of work as a physiologist is performance training and rehab uh, with these uh, special warfare uh, personnel. Uh, I have a PhD in exercise physiology, um, retired army uh, officer, and yeah, and an endurance background uh, for cycling and triathlon as well. Awesome. So that brings lots of different things together as well. Yeah. And I'm I'm interested really quickly to hear what that team involves, right? So there's a hundred uh, military personnel, but what's the team around that team? How does that yeah, work? Because so, obviously in a, in a sports setting, it might be different to this. Yeah, definitely. So we're uh, we're talking about um, military personnel. So we're talking about a tactical population. So shoot, move, communicate is one of the is one of the big things. Um, so you know, part of being part of the U.S. military, it's so it, we're on the front line tactical scenarios uh, with that. And within the unit, is, so you have the main personnel, the operators, and then you have support teams, whether it's human resources, medical, uh, human performance, which that's all encompassing in, in, my, in my domain, and then uh, communication satellites, X, Y, and Z, all to support the operators to be able to do their job, uh, whatever the mission dictates. And how many how many support staff are there for those 100 personnel? Um, I can't go into exact details on that, but there's <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can I can understand. Yeah. Like, uh, I can uh, I can press you for more information, but uh, yeah, if you if you uh, can't give away that, that's uh, that's yeah. all good. Um, so obviously we're here to discuss the things that you can discuss, and that's that's physiology, yeah. right? So, um, before we get into all the depths of the physiology that you go into, what what are tactical populations and why is then physiology important for them? Yeah, definitely. So if you look at uh, tactical populations versus athletics, there's similarities, but significant differences as well, right? So to win a game is to win a game. Uh, to win is mission success, where if the fail is in a game, you lose the game. Okay, so you go back and try again. Here it could be the, it could be the ultimate ending. Um, what, you know, and that could be the case, right? And so physiology really plays into that, whether it's for a medical sense for uh, treatment triage or for performance optimization. And that's kind of the key where we'll be talking about. And that's the kind of the area that I work in uh, within these, with these guys. And what, why is it then for them important? Obviously, you kind of mentioned, yeah, that could be the ultimate end. Like, what yeah. what are the, the the success metrics that you work towards? What's the the yeah. Yeah, the importance of having that all on point? Definitely. So when we look, if we were to equate these guys to athletes, they're essentially in competition season all all year long. So whereas with in sports, it, it undulates. You'll have your preseason, you have your build, you have competition, you have your off season. We're pretty much in season all year round. Uh, we'll have a couple of drops here and there for people to recover, go home, visit families. But pretty much you have to be near your your peak all year round. So you, if you're looking at endurance sports, you may peak for an, a, a, a single event. Or for soccer, swimming, you, and that's probably closer to the type of model that we would have to follow with us because – they have very long seasons or multiple seasons that just kind of go back to back. Uh, and you have to be near max. You may not be at 100%, but you may be at 97% throughout that. And that's kind of the type of model, if you can compare it to athletics, that we have to follow. 
So that that's the first point with that. So how do you always keep these guys always near their peak uh, performance all day, uh, all year long? Second is when it comes down to readiness. And when we talk about readiness is the number of uh, number of personnel that are available to go each and every day. And also the other side of that is what we could kind of term uh, combat regeneration. So it's how back, how quickly can they come back from a mission, reset and go back out? You know, how do you take the standard, let's say the standard is five days. How do you shorten it to three days? Rinse and repeat. You know, and that's what we, that's pretty much what re, uh, combat regeneration is. So it's all about readiness and getting back after it. I think that's a, there's a lot of parallels, of course, that people can then take from, yeah. uh, from this and apply to the sporting world. But exactly. I, I know that you, you look very holistically at, at performance. So can you give us a quick description of, of what that might mean, uh, as opposed to looking maybe in one siloed part of a uh, performance yeah. spectrum? Yeah. So the way we look at it and we, we look at it and the way we structured our program is the human performance optimization modeling. So there's a big difference between HPO and human performance, also known as HP. HP is where it really started. And we've all seen the, uh, um, the Greek type of um, picture where you have the pillars, you got the person, the different pillars, and then you got human performance on top. Well, that's good, but they're stovepiped, right? So those pillars really domain, you know, each of those uh, domains are stovepiped. When you look at HPO as itself is those pillars are now kind of into a domain and you have more of a, um, a Venn diagram per se, right? So each domain has its own area, but they intersect together. And so with that intersection is there, those, those domains are really interlaced. So you really don't know what's really touching that uh, person, but they're all working synergistically. And that's, that's kind of the model that we go for. And so if you look at our program, we have what's called a four domain model. So, and the domain is just that it's an area of emphasis. So musculoskeletal, which is where a physical therapist and I work with, you know, domain, uh, medical, where we have some medical personnel there, uh, nutrition, and then, um, oh, uh, uh, Psychological, sorry, drew a blank there for a second. So, <laughs> you know, so trying to encompass the whole being, but all this is determined on the needs analysis, right? So it's the same type of needs analysis that as strength coaches, we do. Um, it's just applied to a programmatic level. And so we, you know, it's that intersection of what are the needs of the, uh, of our unit? What uh, fiscal constraints do we have? Personnel constraints. And, that's where we ended up with our four, four domain model. I've seen others where I have five and six domain models where they split out the spiritual, uh, psychological, and cognitive into their own own little domains because they're able to have the personnel. Um, look at uh, the U.S. Army uh, Special Forces has a program called POTIF. Um, that's a it's a wellness based, and so it's a four domain model where you got the musculoskeletal, you've got the medical, but spiritual and uh, psychological or two domains. So they had, they really heavy on that wellness because of that was based on the needs of special forces. So it's really just dependent on the needs of the individuals, the organization and um, resources allocated to the program that help determine that. And then when, when you, when you have all of those domains, right? Like what, what do what do the tactical practitioners and need like what, what do those athletes or those those um, military personnel need to optimize their performance because there's a lot of different stuff going on there yeah. like how how do you start to tap into that what, what do they need on a on a daily weekly monthly basis yeah so the first thing is kind of teasing out the difference between athletes and um you know tactical first responder and uh, law enforcement populations so typically they're referred to as tactical athletes um, and I used to, up until I took this position, but, and started working more and more one-on-one -on -one with operators, they'll tell you they're not athletes. Um, they'll be the first to admit it because if you look at an athlete, especially our high performing athletes, everything about their day is regimented. What they eat is regimented. They know how many hours of sleep. Um, they know when they're drinking they know when they're resting. Um, uh, when it comes to military, they 
you know, they have a certain hour out of the day. And after that, they're it's on their own. They're doing their day to day stuff. They're training their missions and they're eating and they're eating what they can, when they can. Whereas an athlete is okay. I know at 8 a.m. I'm going to eat X, Y, and Z, 10 a.m., whatever. Right. And they have a whole team supporting them 24 seven. It's different for these guys. There's that. And then secondly, is if you go back to what we were talking about, the differences between, you know, work, winning in a game versus on a mission setting, the stakes are much higher as well. So you have those different stresses going in there, also being away from the home, uh, going into uh, combat environments. So there's, even though there's a lot of differences, there's a lot of subtle differences that really change on how you apply, uh, you know, HP, HPO to these guys. And this is where, the, uh, to these populations. And this is where I originally found the term, uh, the human weapon system back. Uh, it was an article that was written in uh, 2009, but it never, the term was never defined. And that's what I wanted to set out to do is actually define that term. And in my book, the human weapon system, we, we, we do define it really. And you look at the human being as a holistic system of cognitive behavioral um, musculoskeletal systems that are professionally trained to do what military law enforcement and first responders do within a uh, legal, legal and moral bounds. You know, that's the, um, how I've defined HWS in a nutshell. And so when you look through through that prism, you, you apply HPO differently because the needs are different. Right. So, and that goes back to, okay, some of the things these uh there's sleep issues there's a lot of things you'll see with that and so if you have sleep issues you have to dive in okay what is causing that is it is it a psychological issue is it the big three caffeine tobacco and alcohol right um <laughs> so you have to divide that you have to look at that too as well um, those are big uh factors in military populations and definitely in your some of your law enforcement fire and uh first responder populations too so when you look at those things, those those help define the needs of them. And again, that all goes back into what you identify and the needs analysis, but looking at through through that prism. And can, can you like delve into some of the specifics then in the in the physiology side of things? I know yeah. that's, that's your warehouse. Like what what are you looking for in those populations? Is it a gigantic aerobic basis? Or is it like a, a really specific strength thing? Or how how does that look? Yeah, so it's really it's really specific on on their needs. So the needs and the needs for the the group of guys and gals I work with now are completely different with some of the sol um, the American just regular infantry soldiers that I work with in the past. So where even though they have similar uh, differences, where they have to carry heavy loads, it's here is they have to have a wide aerobic base, right? Because they're they're marching further. They're also doing special warfare type of operations. So it's def definitely different needs. It, it's interesting where they need to have a lot of strength and power, but they have to be very, they have to have a wide aerobic base. So how do you balance that, right? Without tearing too far to one side, because if you have too much muscle mass, that's going to hurt the other. And so it's always finding that balance, but also is within, you have so many different capabilities within this group. So when you're looking at it from an organizational standpoint, you have so many different individual needs is how do you work that? And that's where we start looking at uh, key performance metrics. And one of the ways I, I do it is like almost like a report card, right? So we looked at the, through the past couple of years, we've kind of identified, okay, with all the data that we've collected, what are the key benchmarks of both absolute and relative that work for their needs to help identify what they need to be successful in for in their career field and in the mission setting? And so they do have their they do have a, a a fitness test they have to pass. So definitely some of those metrics are in there. But then we also looked at some you know key um, you know basically tactical skills analogs right that work within the uh the gym so the big three right bench press back squat and deadlift those cover a lot of their skills so we're using those as an uh analogs for those and so like the the big three you know the bench press uh squat and deadlift we put those in relative metrics 
and for those who don't know relative is you take the the weight of what's being lifted and you divide it by your body weight and that gives you a relative metric that allows you know matt you and me to compare our numbers and i guarantee your numbers will be much better than mine and so <laughs> and that right. <laughs> to see that right it, it equates the uh the field so we have those anthropometric uh, stuff and now we're working on ra um, range of motion metrics to really kind of see okay where you're at are you within the bounds of some of these key range of motions that you need to be successful for the field and we take that and we're able to really tease out okay these are the limiters for these guys create them on put them on this track okay these guys are here we need to put them on this track and that's how we've done it I'm I'm really excited to get into a, a case study on that in just yeah. a second, but um, and to get some real like some proper details and fill mm -hmm. that all out. But before we do, um, what are the barriers to to achieving those things? Because it's it sounds really good. Um, it sounds like you can mm -hmm. get a nice kind of system in place. You get your KPIs. You go right. We're going to improve yep. A, B, and C. We're going to periodize nicely. That's probably not what it's like, right? So yeah. can, you, can you take us through what the real the real world does to you? The key word is periodization, right? there is no periodization um i'll tell you that right now yeah. just because of consistency and just and the number of touch points i have with these personnel throughout because they're always in and out and moving right so i may only have them for three weeks at a time and i may not see them again for three months so periodization true linear or even block periodization is out the window really have to follow more of your um your flexible periodization and let the data guide it and that's the way we do it um and it would be lovely to build an annual training plan that is blocked out right you know we can see that build maintain it have those recovery days in there it's not so we you know we look at the data and we also have some protocols in place for when guys come back, okay, you're automatically going to go into this recovery phase and then we'll onboard you back into the system. So that's kind of how we've had to build that. Um, it, it's still a learning progress. I mean, we're still reiterating the program and I don't think it'll, we've definitely gotten to a steady state, but it'll never be consistent because the mission set's changing, the schedule's always changing and, well, and the personnel are changing too. So the needs of the personnel are changing every year or so just due to rotations and such so we do those definitely if you look at from a systematic model you're doing the reviews and we're going through that right now where okay we're re relooking on how we're writing the uh the workouts and what we're applying especially with the um the revamped um performance report card which has given us so much more data a little more clarity is how we bridging people out within that. And so um, that's how we do it. And then if we look at for an individual training session, um, goal wise, we have a primary, secondary, and tertiary that we try to get to. Um, so, and then on top of that, we have, you know, anywhere from 90 minutes to, you know, two hours for training. So definitely a good warm up, dynamic warm up, mobility work, primers. You got your main set. Um, based on the goal, the primary, secondary goals, and you got the cool down. Um, and then the way I, from there is to further break it out. If we have guys that are going in and out on, on the road quite a bit to say, look, okay, for this week, these are the highlights for the week. This is the minimum you need to hit to be able to maintain. To, so to try to take some of that pressure off as well. So when, when it comes to bringing this all together, obviously, um, I'm excited to hear about how that, that all works in, in quote unquote real life. Mm -hmm. So can you take us to a, a case study where you've maybe got, gone through all of the things you've explained and just like filled that out with some, some sets, some reps, an example session, for example, and like how you would then deal with some of the problems that you've, you've just, uh, just outlined for us. Yeah, definitely. So we can just talk about what we're going through right now with the realignment that we're going through within our program. So given my background, I'm, I would call you more, call myself more of a traditionalist. So, you know, the traditional strength, you know, strength and conditioning coaching, I don't, don't really do a lot of wad work or, you know, CrossFit style type of work. It's more that traditional 
hypertrophy strength, uh, strength and power building with a little bit of Olympic lifting in there. So that's kind of where I've, I, I view things in the way I apply it, just to give you a little bit of context, but that's not for everyone. And we, and that wad thing will creep itself in here into a second. So on our last, on the last uh, revamp that we did last year, moving into this year, it was a very structured um, strength building program. And so very traditional working on the big three, again, bench press, back squat and deadlift. Um, and then working with your accessories in there as well, um, with your compound exercises first, followed by your your auxiliary exercises, um, very similar. Well, the one thing we we're noticing is range of motion numbers were starting to drop. Um, we did have significant increases in performance numbers, but guys were working a little bit stiffer, range of motion was down, and even motivation, I guess you can say, was down a little bit too, because some of the... Uh, some you have to have that buy-in both from the leadership and the operator, and that's what really makes HPO work well. Um, that's something I should have said earlier, and that's always something you take into consideration when you're building these organizational things. So, what we did is we created what we call a tiger team and representatives from the um, from the unit. You know, mix of younger younger airmen and uh, uh, middle middle level NCOs, not commissioned officers. And they're the voice of the guys. And, you know, we sit down, we have meetings every other week kind of talking about this, you know, and we went through um, a mini needs analysis, right? I showed them what I see and what we're going through and what they would kind of like to see. And two of the uh, big items that came up, one was mobility. And that, again, that goes back to those range of motion numbers that we saw coming out of our testing, um, our performance testing. And the second is watts. The guys want some more of that high intensity work in there that I traditionally don't embrace. So, okay, let's go through and let's revamp it and see you know, what we can do for one to keep team cohesion together, which was something else that they wanted, which we weren't really taking into account. And let's rebuild it. So like before we're, it was just a right, even though that two hour set, the warm up was about 25 minutes. So it was a dynamic warm up with um, a little bit of uh, mobi- uh, primer work, whether it's shoulder or gluteal, based off what, what they're doing in the first first sets. Going to that main set, that main set was maybe about 60 minutes. Um, and again, based on the goal, was it a cardio, anaerobic, or upper or lower body day, right? And then um, a 25 minute, uh, excuse me, a 15 to 20 minute cool down. Um, so we looked at it a little bit. So first off, looked at, okay, how many people can I fit into our facility at one point? Um, and then based on the number of racks and stations, so you know, we have a certain number of uh, racks and I can fit maybe about 35 people um, at the stations. And that's three people per station, right? You know, with safety, trying to keep it in there. Those numbers worked out great. We were just right there based off uh, the different kind of plans we do based off that performance uh, report card to you know, keep the um, keep the different uh, uh, teams together, working out together within their individual within their uh, block plans, and so that that worked great. It, we, we only had like one or two numbers off, so if we had one too much, it wouldn't work. But luckily, we're one or two under, which worked out perfect. So I can have so many people on the racks, and I can have the other half of the unit on the floor doing uh, agility and conditioning work. And then we can do a flip-flop on the next day. So I offset, so I'm able to maximize our our floor space. And that's one of the things that the guys wanted is they wanted to be able to work out um, within their their teams. We'd had everyone working out together, but it was not as coordinated. So that was one of the first things we were able to do. And we're, and a lot of the guys are having that hope that seems to be increasing the buy and the motivation seemed to have gone up over these recent weeks with that. Secondly, is we've been adding in um, mobility work as part of the warm up. So traditionally, I would just have a regular dynamic warm up where we do um, whether it's hurdles, uh, speed ladders, after you know jump rope for five minutes, get on the bike, and the snap crack will pop out. You know the old man stuff, right? And go from there. Well, now it's a little more deliberate, and um, we've created ten new uh, whole body, upper body, and lower body uh, mobility routines. You're talking about your Spider-Man, um, your different um, variations of it. You got your hip cars, um, stepping over hurdles, under hurdles, little things like that. And that seemed, you know, 
the jury's still out. Let's see if that still works. But a lot of the guys are embracing it. And that, again, that goes back into that buy-in and trying to address some of the limitations that we saw in the data, but also the the wants of the um, of of the operators as well. So we're we're taking that, and then we're really working into the strength, you know, using our performance report card to guide the uh, the, the resistance training program, which is still pretty. That's not really changing too much, except for the team cohesion components of it, and really organizing these guys into um, four different plans based on the data versus the six to eight that we originally had. So we were able to simplify it a little bit more because we're getting a little more clarity in the data based on that performance report card. But then when we're going into the interval conditioning, really trying to embrace the um, high intensity interval training, some of these wads and stuff. Um, And so, but how do you work that on a maxed out capacity of the training facility? And that is an interesting puzzle piece. Um, Slowly getting there. It's been hit or miss. Um, Definitely getting some feedback from the guys. Um, But within that, I'm having them feed me some of the the uh, some of the work that they like to do, some of those wise, some of those mobility routines. And yeah, you know, definitely will have to tweak it a little bit, whether, you know, kind of meet the needs of the population and also our facilities. But it's also, hey, they're getting to see stuff that they like to do within the organizational program. So that's kind of, you know, I'd say that's kind of, that's a real world uh, case study that we're going through right now. I know it's a little bit vague, but hopefully enough to kind of show where we went from to where we're trying to go to. Oh, so I think it's absolutely excellent. It's really interesting insight into all of the different things that um, that you have to deal with, but also the solutions to the problems as well. Like they, they, things like keeping the the strength stuff pretty consistent, allowing them to be uh, to be fairly regimen within that, but obviously giving them creativity for the mobility stuff mm-hmm. and adding in different components and their own viewpoints on, on what they want to find. I think that's a really interesting look at things. Yeah. But um, before before we finish up and uh, I let you crack on with the rest of your day, uh, you mentioned, of course, you've got a book out as well. Can you take us through what that's about and, and who might find that particularly interesting? Yeah, definitely. So uh, the book is called The Human Weapon System. Uh, it was published by uh, uh, last week by uh, Springer Nature. Um, and so what it does, it, it it's trying to add, add to the conversation on how we look at human performance optimization for our tactical populations, uh, law enforcement, and first responder populations. Again, it goes back into that base definition of when we call these uh, populations tactical athletes, they're they're not athletes. We have to kind of change that prism on how we look at them based on the 20 plus years of human performance programs that we've done within the Department of Defense and within um, you know the civilian tactical populations as well. And I view it as a human weapon system, you know, because it, the human bot, the, a human being is a system of systems. You you have cardiovascular system, you got a skeletal muscle system, emotional system, neuro uh, neurological. It's many different systems, and so the human and system are together, right? You know, they you're a human being, you're you're a system of systems, but the weapon really comes down to its base definition. And when someone usually hears about a weapon, is oh kill or destroy something well no if you really look at the dictionary it's a it's a tool a weapon is a tool to get something done um it's just over the years it's kind of gotten to that um gotten to that point but when you look at it it, you know the a human weapon system is a system of subsystems of you know that's professionally uh, professionally trained to either heal destroy protect or build within the laws, uh, more, more laws of the society or moral and ethical boundaries. That's really how I look at it within that prism. And that's how I define human, and that's how I look at the needs and define human performance optimization um, for these guys. And the book really kind of takes that and runs with it. And the book, the book is really based on my experiences uh, for the past few years within the unit and what the, uh, the operators in this unit have taught me. and. And that I want to just add more to the conversation and trying to help build that body of knowledge. Absolutely excellent. So Chris, massive thanks for your time and efforts today. It's been a pleasure talking. Where can people find a little bit more about you and uh, what you're up to? Yeah, so uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Chris Myers, M-Y-E-R-S. 
I also have a coaching firm called Three Sports Science. So you can either find that on LinkedIn or on Facebook as well. Um, and feel free to um, reach out with any questions you may have. I'd be more than happy to chat. Fantastic. Chris, massive thanks. And I look forward to speaking Great. again soon. You too. Cheers. Cheers, buddy. Uh, you don't have to leave immediately, but it's... Uh... And that's it. Once again, a massive thanks to Chris for all of his hard work on today's podcast. I really appreciate it. I'm sure you do at home too. Before you leave, I want to point you in the direction of the Science of Sport Coach Academy. And the Coach Academy is an overgrowing library of sports science courses, which are broken down into bite-sized chunks. So if you've enjoyed today's podcast and you want to get your hands on some more great sports science information, you can get yourself into the Coach Academy completely for free using that link in the show notes in just a few seconds time. And of course, if you have enjoyed today's podcast, it'd be fantastic if you could recommend us to a coach, a colleague, an athlete, or a friend. That means that we can keep bringing you the best possible guests and the best possible content. And that's it. Once again, a massive thanks from me. I'm Matt Solomon of Science of Sport. And I'll speak to you next week.